tonight, the U.S. carrying out another round of airstrikes in the Middle East, this time hitting targets inside Yemen. Exclusive video of the planes that carried out tonight's attack and new video from the first round of attacks. Explosions in Iraq and Syria, buildings on fire, others completely destroyed. New details on what was targeted as leaders in the region blast the U.S. Are reporters in Iraq and embedded with the U.S. Navy in the region? Plus the high-tech bomber that flew from the U.S. thousands of miles to strike its targets. Did voters turn out in the first real test for President Biden? Democrats voting in the first official primary today. We're on the ground in South Carolina. Life-threatening floods forecast in California. Evacuation warnings as 36 million brace for the worst. New details on the moments before a small plane crashed into a mobile home park. The chilling audio. They went down hard. They're in planes. NBC News exclusive, the CEO of the train company one year after the derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. What he's promising residents and how they feel about him. You feel welcome in this town? This is NBC Nightly News with Jose diaz Ballard. Good evening. The U.S. launched new airstrikes tonight in the Middle East, the day after the U.S. launched the campaign to strike back at groups that have been targeting Americans and American interests in the region. Today, we got our first images of the destruction from last night's attacks. You can see the explosions in the distance, and you can see the extensive damage up close. The strikes tonight, targeting missile sites in Yemen, where Iran-backed militias have been firing on commercial ships. The strikes last night allegedly killing soldiers and civilians across Syria and Iraq, according to officials there. The campaign could last for weeks, a response to the American soldiers killed in Jordan earlier this week and the hundreds of smaller attacks that preceded that. Our reporters are spread out across the region. We begin tonight with Courtney Kuby, who was the only journalist on board the Navy ship that launched today's attack inside Yemen. Courtney? The U.S. and British military conducted strikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen tonight, launching more than two dozen aircraft from here, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower in the Red Sea. This is the second night in a row that aircraft from the Eisenhower have targeted the Iranian-backed Houthi rebel. Earlier today, the U.S. struck an anti-ship cruise missile in Yemen that they deem presented an imminent threat. Defense officials say tonight's strikes are not part of Operation Prosperity Guardian, a coalition working to defend ships against these Houthi attacks. U.S. destroyers, including the USS Bravely, also targeted the Houthis tonight, firing Tomahawk missiles. We traveled to the USS Mason today, where they demonstrated the split-second decision-making necessary to shoot down an incoming missile. In this scenario, launching a standard missile to intercept the threat. Despite other strikes by the U.S. and British militaries in recent weeks, the Houthis have continued to target commercial and military ships. And so far tonight, no response from the Houthis. Courtney QB, thank you. We are also getting a first look tonight at the aftermath of those first strikes on targets in Syria and Iraq. Both countries and Iran now blasting the attacks. Keir Simmons reports from Erbil, Iraq. Explosions in Iraq and Syria overnight. Today, the U.S. assessing the aftermath of Friday night's operation, involving, it said, 85 strikes and 125 precision munitions, while local reports say around 40 were killed. Targets on the Syrian-Iraqi border, strongholds of Iranian-backed militia accused of carrying out the deadly attack on a U.S. base in Jordan. As the bodies of those servicemen and women arrived home, U.S. B-1 bombers were already on their way from the United States, traveling thousands of miles and refueling in flight, hitting, the Pentagon says, munitions, drone facilities and Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. There were no strikes inside Iran, but America's unmistakable message directed squarely at the Iranian leadership. Iran condemning the strikes, but notably not vowing to respond. Baghdad's government, with links to the US and Iran, calling in America's deputy chief of mission to receive a formal protest. Iraq furiously saying it was not warned. US officials insisting it was. Iran's deepening influence here, evident when tonight we reached a spokesman for an Iranian-backed militia, Taib Saeed al-Shohada. We are in a state of war, he tells us. Why is U.S. involvement in Iraq an invasion of sovereignty, but Iran's involvement isn't? 
Today, the USA has killed Iraqis, he says, while Iran fought with Iraq against ISIS. He admits the US fought ISIS too. Thank you for your help, he says. It's time to go back home. The Biden administration tonight trying to persuade Iran to change course while avoiding a widening regional conflict. Dual challenges, together, a formidable task. And Kier joins us from our bill. Kier, how much damage was done in this first retaliatory strike? Well, we are waiting for that assessment from the Pentagon, Jose, but tonight there are those criticizing the U.S. decision to signal that these strikes were coming, saying potentially it allowed Iranian operatives to get out of harm's way. Tonight, we are told by officials more strikes are on the way. Jose? Keir Simmons in Erbil, Iraq. Thank you. The airstrikes come amid breaking news here in the U.S. Tonight, the polls have closed in South Carolina, the first official Democratic primary of 2024. And NBC News now projects President Biden has won that state. Gabe Gutierrez is there with more on Biden's primary victory and voter reaction to the airstrikes. Tonight in South Carolina, voters are reacting to the president's retaliatory airstrikes. I approved of the president's decision. I thought they were targeted, which is better than a blanket type of strike. Uh, I think it's, they were targeted to try to prevent civilian deaths as well. And it's kind of that you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. We can't ignore what they did by killing some of our service people, but then the last thing we need to do is stir that area up and make it worse. Palestine will never die! But not everyone supports the escalation. We're attacking them and we're giving them cause to attack back. Lawmakers also weighing in, Democrats calling the strikes the first stage in a well-thought-out, strong and measured campaign. There has to be a consequence for anyone that kills American troops. And so going against those groups identified as responsible for the deaths of these three reservists from Georgia, very understandable, and that's within the president's self-defense powers. But some Republicans are blasting the Biden administration for conducting the airstrikes without congressional approval. Others are taking issue with the timing, writing in true Biden fashion, he waited too long. He telegraphed a weak response over days and gave our enemies time to withdraw their military leadership and assets. The entire region knew this was coming and that many of those facilities were evacuated. President Biden today visiting his campaign headquarters in Delaware. This is not just a campaign. This is more of a mission. While here in the South Carolina primary tonight, South Carolina, go vote today. NBC News projects he will decisively win over challengers Congressman Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson. I'm supportive of Biden. Yeah. Yeah, it's always been the uh, support of Biden and Obama. He's tried hard to make the country better, and I trust him. Gabe joins us now from a polling location in Columbia, South Carolina. Gabe, uh, how's turnout been so far? Turnout was low, Jose, with President Biden as the incumbent. The Republican primary between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley is expected to draw more attention later this month. Jose? Gabe Gutierrez in Columbia, South Carolina. Thank you. Today, House Republicans announced a, a new tactic that could complicate a long-negotiated national security bill. Republican Speaker Mike Johnson announced a standalone bill to give Israel nearly $18 billion to fight its war against Hamas. That proposal is separate from the Senate package that includes money for Ukraine, Taiwan, and efforts to control the humanitarian crisis along the U.S. border. California is bracing for potentially deadly flooding along its coast this weekend. 36 million are at risk for flooding, strong winds, and blizzard-like conditions. Dana Griffin is in Santa Barbara, where officials are warning residents to evacuate. Dana. Jose, up and down the state, they're preparing for heavy rain out into the distance. You can see storm preps happening right now on the beach as they build these sand berms. Evacuation orders are in effect, and all beaches here are now closed. Part of the 101 freeway prone to flooding could be shut down. People waiting in line for hours to fill up sandbags. A backhoe removing large rocks from a river to help prevent it from overflowing. Rain is expected to start late tonight and, and could continue until Monday, three to six inches along the coast, six to 12 inches possible in higher elevations and wind gusts in some areas as high as 60 miles per hour. Jose officials warning people to get what you need now. Dana Griffin in Santa Barbara, thank you. 
Overseas in Chile tonight, deadly out-of-control wildfires are ripping through some of the country's most popular tourist destinations. Nearly 50 people have died in fires burning near Santiago on the central coast all the way down south. Many residents are fleeing their homes, and the president of Chile declared a state of emergency. No cause yet, but it's summer there, and they've been suffering through a heat wave, drought, and high wind conditions. Back here in the U.S., we have new details tonight on that deadly plane crash in Florida, the flight's final moments, and what we now know about those who perished. Here's Marisa Parra. A deadly plane crash and fiery eruption in Clearwater, Florida. The three victims now identified, Martha Perry and Mary Ellen Pender, who were inside the mobile home that pilot Jemin Patel's plane crashed into. I can't see the other airport. His desperate calls for help and his final moments, providing clues to what went wrong. I'm losing engine. After seconds of silence with air traffic control, another pilot. Just saw him going down at an extremely high rate of speed. So they went down hard, they're in flames. The doomed single-engine plane, a Beechcraft Bonanza V-35, had departed Vero Beach, scheduled to arrive an hour later at Clearwater Air Park, crashing three miles away instead, ending in tragedy. Today, the NTSB investigating the accident, removing the pieces of the plane. The mobile home it landed on didn't stand a chance. Smoke still rising from the scene 24 hours later. It pretty much demolished that, that mobile home, um, and then the f ensuing fire consumed most of the rest. The fuel from the plane, together with the impact, created a towering inferno. The plane just crashed. Neighbor Rick Renner took this video. House shook, windows rattled. Well, when I pulled out of my driveway, you could see the header of smoke and the flames up in the air for 50 feet. Emergency crews rescued neighbors trapped by flames next door, working through the night to put out hot spots. But 86-year-old Martha Perry, described by family as a beloved great-grandmother, and Mary Ellen Pender couldn't be saved. Prayers for the families. I mean, they're, they're going to need, you know, help from everybody. A shaken community looking for consolation and answers. Marissa Parra, NBC News, Clearwater, Florida. Up next, an NBC News exclusive. We are in East Palestine, Ohio, with the Norfolk Southern CEO one year after that toxic train derailment. What's changed since then, and do residents think the company's done enough? We are back with an NBC News exclusive. It has been exactly one year since a train carrying toxic chemicals derailed and caught fire in East Palestine, Ohio. Since then, residents fear for their health and their livelihoods. Our George Solis went back to East Palestine for an exclusive interview with the rail company CEO, pressing him on efforts to make things right with that community. Do you feel welcome in this town? Yeah. Um, I really enjoy coming back. One year after the Norfolk Southern toxic train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, company CEO Alan Shaw says he remains committed to the community. What do you say to that family who is worried about their long-term health here in the town. Yeah, you know, I, I hear that, all right, and I certainly understand it. Shaw says he's been here 20 to 30 times since last February's fiery derailment and subsequent chemical spill the NTSB says was caused by an overheated wheel bearing. The controlled explosion of five train cars containing hazardous chemicals leading to massive smoke plumes over the village and led to evacuations. Kathy Rimby keeps her Norfolk Southern issued air purifier running as a precaution. We are, you know, running it daily and we also um, are still drinking bottled water. Norfolk Southern says it's invested more than 100 million in East Palestine. Still, some of Shaw's visits prove more contentious than others. We have our family assistance center. Be remiss to say, obviously, your presence here can still jar up some feelings. What, do you, what are you doing to convince those people who still believe, that, again, Norfolk Southern hasn't done right by them? We're keeping our promises um, each and every day. Do you believe that Norfolk Southern has kept their promises? To what degree? I, I, I don't believe it's that smooth of a transition for anyone. I love my Anna Sevi Dawes, who owns and runs both a gas station and liquor store right next to the train tracks, is part of one of many ongoing lawsuits against the railroad company. Norfolk Southern declining to comment on any cases. There's people and businesses that will never live there anymore. Resident and business owner Joy Masher is also part of the suit. 
She says despite local, state and federal tests that have determined the air, water and soil is safe, she's not convinced. Are they going to be here 15 years when cancer starts forming in clusters or? Shaw says yes. They're now working on a long-term health care fund. Yeah, we're not going to be bounded by time. Today, this is what the crash site looks like. Cleanup of contamination at the derailment zone is done, but work to restore the site is ongoing. And as you can see, these tracks are very much active. EPA approved soil and gravel now being used to refill gaps as environmental testing continues. The company deployed state-of-the-art tech to inspect trains, but lingering questions remain about industry-wide safety. Can you sit here today, one year later, and confidently say that railroads are safer, at least for Norfolk Southern, than they were a year ago? Yes. Norfolk Southern was a safer road. I promise to make a safer road even safer. The White House has announced President Biden will visit East Palestine later this month, his first visit since the derailment, a visit that comes as a bipartisan rail safety bill remains in the balance. Jose? George Solis, thank you. There's good news tonight about the many people you can meet every day who uplift us with their extraordinary joy and positivity. Tonight, we're celebrating just one of those stories. How about a big round of applause for Ms. Ellen? There were songs. Woke up this morning with the light. Grateful for Miss Alice. Here's to you. Here's to you. You've done so much for us over the years. Helping us save the And celebration. Every morning. An outpouring of love honoring Berkeley, California crossing guard Alice K. Talbert, who's just retired from her post at Ruth Acti Elementary after nearly 20 years. Calvin Mackley Welch is just one of the generations of students she's cared for and kept safe. Many returned to thank her for making them feel special. Calvin's mom, Steph, helped organize the emotional send-off and a fundraiser for the woman everyone calls Miss Alice. Steph, what an extraordinary person she is. She's the best of us. Not only keeping us safe, but like showing us what respect looks like, what it looks like to like truly respect other people. If the world was Alice's corner, it would be the world we all want. <laughs> Alice, there was a, a moment when they were singing that song to you, you looked up and and pointed up. Do you remember why? I was thanking God for letting me be the person that I am and taking me through my life journey. A, a life well lived, huh, Alice? I and couldn't ask for more. For this humble woman guided by faith, it's a bittersweet goodbye. I don't have grandchildren, but you're all my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> and the beginning of a new chapter, leading by example and inspiring all of us with these profound words of wisdom. Be friends with one another. <laughs> yes, be friends with one another. And I want every last one of y'all to take a journey to be positive, okay? I love you. Because the world belongs to you guys. <laughs> And you got to make a difference in the world. That's what I want for all of you, to make a difference. And we wish Miss Alice a happy and healthy retirement. That's NBC Nightly News for this Saturday. Kate Snow will be here tomorrow night. I'm Jose diaz Boy. Thank you for the privilege of your time. And good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.